Oh. I am still Pastor Larry Conway. Uh, still <laughs> Chaplain Lawrence Joseph Conway, the third U.S. Army retired. <laughs> and in this third week of five, we're going to go to the land of Syria. I'm going to make a change due to the political situation that next week we will go to Iraq. Because the two countries increasingly are intertwined. And we will save the fantasy land of North Korea for the last time that first Sunday night in July. <coughs> so, this is Syria, outlined in red, a little highlight there, just to give you an idea of where the country is located. You know, Israel is right in here. The Golan Heights that are occupied by Israel are right in this location here. Um, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Iraq. As I've said before, if you want, I don't know, are you okay with the lights out? Or do you want to just have, maybe have a couple on the ends? Yeah, yeah maybe just two on the ends. Yeah. Might work well. So as we've done it before, if you have a question or a challenge, please feel free. Uh, I will answer or tap dance or defer it or do something. <laughs> Okay, now here again is a little close-up of Syria. You can see Damascus is down here. Second largest city, Aleppo, is up here. You may have heard of Hom. Oh, no, where is it? Yeah, yeah, it's Hims. But Hom. Yeah, well, you've got to spell them a little differently. When you're translating from Arabic into English, you can be creative. For example, Quran, K-O-R-A-N I've seen. Q-U-R-A-N I've seen. Q-U-R apostrophe A-N I've seen. It's not that one's wrong and one's right. It's just when you're going from a different lettering system, well, it gets interesting. Uh, Euphrates River, down into Iraq. Turkey to the north. Again, Jordan to the south. Israel, West Bank, and the occupied part of Syria, the Golan Heights. So you can kind of see where we are. But you want to understand Syria? Does that change things a little bit? Let me change it a little more. Okay? So when we talk about land in Syria that people are trying to control, Someone can say they're controlling this. Okay, there's not much out there to control. So you might see maps of one group and it looks like spaghetti rather than controlling a hunk of land. That's because they're controlling valleys, river, civilization, towns. Because in between, there's nothing. So if we're talking about Syria, you're talking about the Fertile Crescent. The antiquity here is the top part of the crescent where it comes up from down toward Egypt, up around, and it goes down through Iraq to the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Gulf, depending on who you talk to. Question, where yeah. is the Euphrates River? Is that on that? Yeah, right here. Okay, and the, the Tigris then? Oh. Tigris comes from oh, okay. more in Iraq. Yeah. Okay. There, when I say desert, I mean desert. I thought that was California. <laughs> no, California is not that bad, actually. I'll speak from experience. It's, it's bleak, it's barren, but it's not that barren. I thought I'd sneak one in from the Qatari desert, but uh, no, I thought I'd be honest. And so I pulled this down off the internet. Um, Syrian desert. In terms of the groups, some of the players, some of the actors involved, this begins to simplify. Because you have to realize that right now Syria is kind of like an impressionistic painting. Different groups scattered here and there. There's not direct hunks of territory that they're controlling in any real sense of the word, as you'll see in a minute. But there are Kurds. They speak the Kurdish language. They are Sunni, Orthodox Sunni. 
You have this Sunni-dominated area of central Syria, but remember, this big hunk of it is what? Desert. 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 Yeah, they got a town here. That's it. And they're not much, unless there's an oasis. You may notice a little bit of water, a little water. So if there's an oasis or something, <coughs> yeah. Otherwise, no. Uh, again, the Golan Heights. Druze Alawites. They are different. <laughs> Let me put it this way. They are two orthodox, each of them separate groups, but each of them are kind of like Jehovah's Witness or Mormons compared to Orthodox Christianity. And the Sunnis keep debating whether these folks are true Muslims or not. As well as these folks down here. They say they are. The Sunnis don't think so, or many Sunnis don't think so. Yes? Assad an Alawite? Assad is an Alawite. Yes. It is a minority group. That's something to keep in mind. Explain some of his actions. So, we've got the Kurds who have the same religion as this group, but there's an ethnic, ethnic difference between Arab and Kurdish. They speak both the Kurdish language. And there are some cultural differences. They have that, those yellow areas. Sunni throughout most of the country, it is the minor, majority group. The Druze. Down here, overwhelmingly, majority, just in this one area, the Alawites from the mountain ridge to the sea. Pastor, could you go over the Sunnis and the uh, sure. Shiites again? I, I will in a minute. I just want to give you the current situation. Okay. I'll leave this one up. ISIS is a group that is so radical that even Al-Qaeda has nothing to do with them. They're the ones that have been expanded in Iraq. Sometimes seen as ISIL, whether you take Levant in English or whether you use Sark or Sirk. Oh, shoot, I'm forgetting. It starts with an S, the word in Arabic. Levant in Arabic starts with the equivalent of an S, hence ISIS. Or ISIL, ISIL, you'll see that too. Free Syrian army, the groups at the, groups at the west of it backing, that's other rebels. There's a number of those groups. Assad, the government in pink. Kurdish areas controlled by Kurds in yellow. But note, government, government. It's not clear World War II style lines. There's so much open space in between you can get through. Because remember, there's a lot of desert. You can tell by the dots of the towns where they are and where they aren't. Look up in here, you'll notice a lot more. This is where most of the population is, and through this area. Mainly controlled by the Assad government, but there are stretches of free Syrian army and other rebels control to include parts of Damascus. Homs in here, although it looks like they may lose that enclave in the near future. The Syrian government has been advancing there. Syrian government's also been advancing in this area, been pushing against ISIS. So as ISIS is gaining in Iraq, they are losing in Syria currently. This is the, in terms of those other rebel groups, that is their stronghold up in this area near Aleppo. And again, you have Kurdish, pretty much where there's ethnic Kurds, they're controlling the area, much as they are in Iraq. So, this is as of this month, it is a battlefield, it is fluid, it is changing. So if you a month from now were to go and pull down a current map, it would probably look a little different. So, with that in mind, I'd like to just take you through a little bit of history. And then we'll get into some of the different groups, what distinguishes them, and then try to see what's driving the train in this conflict. Okay? Sound good? Okay. I'm going to back up a little bit here. <clears throat> this conflict, like many in the Middle East, we have World War I to thank. And our good friends, the British, and in this case, the French. 1915, the war was not going too well for the Allied powers against the 
uh, central powers of Germany, Austro-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And at that time, the Ottoman <coughs> Empire included all of this area. This was all part of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottoman Empire, known then as the sick man of Europe, one of the weakest powers, but yet geographically large, entered the war on the central side, the, the Allied powers thought, oh boy, here is a chance to get some land. But the war wasn't going as well for them as they had hoped. So the British made an agreement with some Arab tribes to set, open another front, to seize land. And they promised the Arabs their own state in this area. Have you ever heard of Lawrence of Arabia? Yeah. Right here. This was his area of operation. Starting with cutting Turkish rail lines, moving to the north, working with uh, Bedouins, eventually conquering the whole area, moving through Jerusalem, and even conquering Damascus. The war ends. The Arabs hold a national congress to form their new nation. And guess who shows up? The British and the French. And they tell the Arabs, you can have this desert down here. Oil had not been discovered yet. <laughs> That's not until the 1930s. So oil has not been discovered yet. You can have the wasteland. British, 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 French, French. And they were all colonized. And there wasn't much the Arabs could do about it. They're still not happy about what happened at the end of World War I. So Syria becomes a nation. But note, the ethnic divisions that go on here under the banner of divide and conquer. Kurdistan wanted to have its own nation declared after World War I. That didn't happen. Instead, they're divided up into Iraq. There's some in Iran. There's a lot in Turkey proper, including some here in Syria in the far northeast. So this hodgepodge country is put together by a group of diplomats drawing a line on a map, literally, with an eye toward dividing groups in order to control them. So it's a French colony. We could uh, save a lot of time. You know, you can, we can talk about various uprisings and how they failed and how the French put it down. But finally, after World War II, this area becomes an independent nation. It briefly, in fact, during World War II, when, the Fra when France falls, Vichy France is formed, this becomes Axis, Vichy, controlled by Vichy France, until it was promptly invaded by Allied troops and then run by Free French. <coughs> um, with independence, there is a president. He is uh, overthrown. There is another president. He is overthrown in 58. There is United Arab Republic. Don't know if you've heard of that or not. Yeah. <laughs> Syria and Egypt merge. Syria and Egypt become one country. Nasser, the president of Egypt, becomes president of the new country. Egypt dominates the arrangement, so much so that three years later, a group of Syrian officers break away and reestablish Syria as a separate country. So that only lasts about three years. A few years after that, Hafez al-Assad seizes power with a coup is a unanimously elected president for seven years. He winds up ruling for 30 years. He is the Assad who was in charge during the, the 67 war where they lost the Golan Heights to Israel and the 73 war where they almost lost Damascus to the Israelis. They sued for peace. Israel was on the way to Damascus. But to be honest, the Israelis who didn't want to try to occupy and control a city as large as Damascus with a hostile population, so they were just as happy to stop, in all honesty. But the Syrian army has never been known as a great military force. And they proved it in 67, 
and they proved it again in 73. Um, in 1994, Hafez's eldest son dies in an automobile accident, and his second son, Bashir, who is a pediatrician, and if I remember correctly, he's in London, he gets a call from Daddy. You need to come back and be the next president of Syria after me. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Is this a monarchy or is this a democracy, a democratic government? Yeah. In the Middle East, if it says president, doesn't mean it's a president. It can be a king in everything but name, and that's what's going on in Syria. It works like a monarchy. It functions like a monarchy. It behaves like a monarchy. And this Alawite minority government controls Syria. If you're not Alawite, you're not in a position of authority. Senior top level authority. The Alawite clans control all the key jobs. What, what, kind of, what percentage do they represent? Them? Oh gosh, 12, 15%, something like that. Okay. So it's a substantial minority, but still a minority. Yeah, yeah. 2000, Bashir. The pediatrician takes over, and there's real hope for a while that he will be a reformer and maybe make to turn Syria into a real functioning democracy. Didn't happen. Arab Spring hits, civil war begins, and that got us to too far. End of slideshow. Yeah, end of slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> to this in June of 14. Questions, comments on history? Okay. Let's now go into some of this, some of the features of this four-way civil war. Because it is not everybody against Assad. There have been battles between this Free Syrian Army and ISIS. There have been battles with the Kurds and ISIS. Assad and the Kurds. It's a four-way civil war. Okay? And these areas down here that are other rebels, Druze. Areas that Druze have been able to hold. The government has been able to seize much of that area, but a lot of it is pretty rugged, and it's the mountainous areas I would imagine they're still holding. Pastor? Yeah. I know there's a Christian presence in Syria. Yes. Are they involved in any fighting at all, or are they just caught between? The few that are left are caught between. There has been a mass exodus of Christians out of Syria, out of Iraq. <laughs> At one time, there was a 10% minority Christian. And they were primarily in urban areas in and around cities. They are largely gone. Because of, with this sectarian fighting, there's becoming less and less tolerance for anybody who doesn't look, act, and pray like me. Or use my language. Did ISIS just execute a group of Christians? Yep. ISIS, yeah, they've executed Iraqi soldiers because they were Sunnis. They let the, or Shia rather. They let the Sunnis go free, but if you were Shia, you were executed. Uh, they have executed Christians. They have done, you name it. They are barbarians in the truest sense of the word. They forbid foreign, foreign journalists, foreign media, and they are reportedly it's instituting in this area of Syria strict, strict Sharia law according to their interpretation. Okay? So in the Islamic world of the Sunnis, you've got the liberals. They're up in Turkey by the way. Turkish government, 97%, country is 97% Muslim, and yet only until recently a woman could not wear a headscarf in school or university. Not had to, couldn't wear it. Different place. You get into these folks, they are on the far, far, they're off the cliff on the right. Um, I'm trying to think in Christianity, it would be roughly equivalent to the KKK. 
okay, or the Aryan nation, you may have heard of them. They're no yeah. longer around by that name. Mm -hmm. Radical groups that claim to be Christian. Mm -hmm. That's the Islamic version. <coughs> they have been successful in fanning hatred of Assad and his Alawite government to take this. They are ruthless, they are brutal, they are well funded, they are well, well trained. And if you want to know who's funding them, look to Qatar and look to Saudi Arabia. <coughs> They're barely disguising it. It's one of those worst kept secrets. They also, when they overran a couple of cities in this area, stole about two billion dollars. Two billion in bullion and other precious metals, that's a, that'll buy you a lot of jihad. So they are well funded and they are being trained. So that's part of why they're doing that well. But, so you've got these folks that are way off the map. Extremely strict interpretation of Sharia. I think Mohammed would be shocked at how strict they are. <coughs> yeah? Considering how the rest of the world views them, why are they getting funds from Qatar and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia? Because they are Sunni. So they don't care they are they're associating themselves with an extremely negative element. They figure once these <coughs> Saudi Arabia's tried this before. Well, they're it failed, too, but they? they've tried it before. They're hoping that if these folks do take over and things settle down, they can mellow them out. Kind of like Chamberlain with Hitler. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if we give Hitler what he wants, he'll calm down, and that's kind of what the Saudis and the Qataris are doing. It's been tried before and it's failed, but that doesn't mean someone doesn't want to try again. So they are now instituting Sharia in areas that they control. Sharia is a very strict legal code. If you are caught Stealing, you get your left hand chopped off. Do it again, you get your right hand chopped off. Uh, women must wear the hijab, the bag, at all times outside the home. Uh, a woman cannot drive, a woman cannot uh, do anything outside the home unless in the company of a male. It's interesting that in Islam in the 9th century during the uh, Baghdad Caliphate, there were women jurors in Islam. Yeah, women who made judgments and they applied to men as well as women. They forget about that. And they say that never happened and they apply this very <coughs> rigid, extremist, twisted form of Islam. In other words, they would say it's suicide bombing. It's not a suicide bomber, because Islam says it's illegal, it's forbidden to commit suicide. The Quran says it is forbidden to commit suicide. So they say they are engaged in anti-oppressor operations, <laughs> or some other euphemism. So they say they go in, strapping something to yourself and blowing yourself up is attacking the enemy. Therefore, it's not suicide. It's not suicide. Also, the Quran says that non-combatants are to be protected, never abused, period. So how do they justify 9-11? Well, all Americans are soldiers of their government, aren't they? You didn't know you enlisted, did you? No. <laughs> That's how they twist the words to fit this very extremist view. But. If you have been under the thumb of an Assad, and next week we'll talk about under the thumb of a Maliki or a Saddam Hussein, they don't look so bad. The trains run on time. Like Mussolini and fascists hit Italy or Germany. Things work. There is, there is no gunfire in the streets. <coughs> Things are relatively calm. I can go about my life as long as I follow all their rules. That's the appeal of an ISIS. The other rebels are more political rather than religious. They are more from more moderate Islamic groups, Sunni <coughs> groups, 
Um, the U.S. and the E.U. has been backing mainly the Free Syrian Army, which is one of those groups. As you can see, they've not been as successful in terms of what they've been able to do. They did control much more down through this area before, but over the past year or so, they have lost most of it to the Assad government, which seems to be getting the upper hand in the conflict. Assad Alawite, from this area, now the Alawites, again, are like the Muslim version of the Mormons, without the evangelism. They don't go knocking on doors trying to get Sunnis to become Alawites. If they did, they would be summarily executed. That's not their thing. But they believe in a divine spark that went from, oh, where it was <clears throat> from Moses to Muhammad <coughs> to Ali, who was the third caliph of Islam. There's some ties with the Shias over in Iran. Okay, so they're closer in faith to the Shia of Iran than they are the Sunnis. So they believe this divine spark came through three incarnations and ended with Ali, and instead of the, sh the shakata of, of Sunni Islam is, I believe there is no God, but God and Muhammad is his prophet. The Alawites say, I believe there is no God, but God and Ali is God. A little different, isn't it? That's why the Sunni look at them like, say what? You don't have it right. Now, the Assad government has been getting outside support. Russia, because Assad is Russia's only ally in the Middle East, the only one left from the Soviet days. Also, they've been receiving substantial help from Iran. And what religious group are the Alawites closest to? The Shia of Iran. So you've got Iran, Russia, backing these folks. You've got the West and the U.S. backing these folks. You've got the Saudis and the Qataris backing these folks. And you've got other Kurdish areas helping these folks, including Iraqi Kurdistan which is independent in everything but name, but I'll save that for next week. So what are the differences, though, between the Shia and the Sunni? Shia and Sunni. There are many cultural differences. I keep forgetting. Brian, I think you know this one. Which one is it where they have the dot and which one isn't? Sunni. Sunni has the dot. When, they, when you do the prayers and you go down the bow, <laughs> you press your head into the ground. If you're Sunni, so you have a little indentation there. <laughs> If you're Shia, you don't press into the ground, so you don't have the indentation. So there's differences in prayer. Uh, Sunnis do not have ayatollahs or clergy. Islam says there is no clergy. But the Shia have ayatollahs. They have a form of clergy. And they are the, they are the ones who run things religiously in Shia areas. It dates back to who should be in charge of the Muslim state? Because the Quran, the Quran is really a law book and a, and a religious book in one. It is both. Think of the law of Moses, Old Testament, kind of like that. So, the first caliph, Muhammad, there was a grandson, or second caliph, then there was Ali, the grandson, the third caliph. By that point, the majority of the Muslims said, we do not want Ali. They instead said, the people of Islam choose who the caliph is. And they chose another person. So there was a split between those who felt that the caliph had to be a blood descendant of Muhammad, the Shia, or the community could choose the Sunnis. Ali was killed in battle, and they warned him to that to this day in Shia areas, taking chains, and men will literally beat their backs bloody, marching through the streets to mourn the death of Ali. So that's kind of the difference between the two. 84% of the world's Muslims are Sunni, 14% are Shia, and everybody else is sort of in there. Alawites are no one else sort of in there. Very small minority. They're nowhere else. They're just in that one area sort of second cousins to the Shia. Questions? Comments? 
observations. Yeah. What year did this split happen? Oh gosh, it was not long after the founding of Islam, 700, 702, somewhere in that area. I'd have to look it up. So it's been a long time. Yes? Sunnis have no clergy? Sunnis have no clergy. They have a teacher, Inam. Much as Judaism has a rabbi, a teacher. Theoretically, any